I'm going to be elaborating somewhat uh, on the reckoning and dismissal of the shepherds who are the rabbis. And I'm going to get into that. The definition is to tell us what this means and, and in part why God has done this. One thing I want to make emphatically clear, since I hadn't heard one word from a rabbi, and I'm quite certain as a group, maybe not all, as a group, they had no idea there'd be a reckoning and a dismissal by God. They would not enter the scroll of remembrance which means they don't see God's heaven for the Jewish people, which is something you do not want to miss. Because they just talk about the Messianic era, all of a sudden Moshiach perfects the world. Everybody loves the Jew and the exhausted in the world. The world, speaking Hebrew, and the sole existence of mankind becomes to know God Nations love nations. Things that simply cannot happen. And what do they leave out? How about God might hurl your glory to the ground or utter destruction if you don't recognize Elijah? You know, you're praying for Moshe every day. One, you don't know you're about to get dismissed when he comes. And two, you completely ignore utter destruction if Elijah is not recognized. He clears the way for the building of a temple, which is God's purpose that might prosper. Don't build it, utter destruction will come someday. Build it, and you will never be defeated and dispersed again. Who should you be looking for? I mean, what does David do? He brings the reckoning and dismissal of the shepherds, the rabbis. That's what David does primarily, and with him comes uh, God's grant of a covenant of friendship which differs markedly, absolutely refutes the Messianic air. God says things like, there'll be a planting of renown when I come with Moshe. You will no longer be the taunts of nations. That, that tells you one thing, the nations aren't exalting you. You're just not being taunted. Why? God's in his temple again, and they're not quite sure if it's true or not. For the most part, that would be the majority. Uh, and of course, the covenant of friendship, well, that is the covenant of friendship. No longer dispersed. You will not be defeated, dispersed. The temple in your midst, the world will know God sanctifies Israel. That's what you get. You don't get perfection throughout the world. You don't get exalted throughout the world. If that's what God had intended, this is where He did written it in the covenant of friendship. It absolutely refutes it. You got utter destruction. Malachi 3, you got your glory hur hurled to the ground, your power. Um, if you don't assist God in recognizing that, that's what it says. He's saying, you know, uh, who is this coming from? Adam, Gentile land, Christianity. Who is this? You know, the people's no one listen to him, and he's not happy about it, and he says it, I think it's verse 3, could be quote. He's stunned that he's not getting a response. Particularly, and I know why now, the mountain of evidence that has been presented to the Jewish people on these videos cannot be surpassed by any other man to come. I'm either him or he ain't coming. Which is it? God said he was coming. God's righteous servant. What was David? A servant who was righteous. Who was Elijah? Servant who was righteous. Who was Moses? Servant who was righteous. Who, else, who are we missing? God's righteous servant. One description, four righteous servants. I am all four men. I, I just reposted it again. I have a verse-by-verse -verse commentary solely showing how I and my life fits Isaiah 53 and explaining it. Explaining what he was wounded for our sins means. No man has ever been able to do that before me. Certainly not totally a singer with his absurdity, an absolute absurdity. Six million Jews die and they're a ram, a ram guilt offering. That's not even all of Israel. That's about one third of Israel at the time. Nobody got long life. 
it looks like Hitler is the one who made the sacrifice, and he didn't get along a lot. No one's made, no one is made righteously because of it. It's an absurdity. Okay, he couldn't come close to interpreting the true meaning in the way to, um, to make this understandable. Isaiah 53 is in large part a snare. Okay, God knew the Gentiles, the Gentiles were going to take your book one way or another. And he set them up. He set them up for the day of the Lord, and he set up the rabbis too. He knew you were going to be practicing the Messianic era. All of these are proof as I straighten all this out, putting forth what he wants Judaism to be. This is what God wants Judaism to be. Not what Rambam wants it to be. He doesn't even want the entire world to be simply to know God. It's not what he wants. Primarily, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm creating a new heaven, he says that first, and a new earth. What's new about the heaven you create? What changes? I'm going to have a new host of angels, the angels of Israel. And I want every Jewish, all of my children to go through the same thing they've all had to go through. Anti-Semitism, racism, bigotry. Uh, having to uh, survive on a planet that simply does not like them. That's what he's looking for. That's the angels of Israel. you got your own unique personality. 613 laws. Okay, about 200 of them were animal sacrifice, and that was done away with by his prophet. God said, I don't want your animals anymore. Yet Toby is saying that thinks he wants a human being. You're not supposed to add to or take away anything from the Torah. And when you see you're about to do it, you better ask yourself, where am I wrong? Where am I wrong to add a human being, much less six million of them? And, you know, let's go on Christian. That's what they did. Let's put a human being in an unblemished land and we'll be sent free. I don't know what, I don't know what you feel the offering did for the, <laughs> for the Jewish people who become the righteous servant. No, the righteous servant <laughs> It's for the day of the Lord. He has to have a Moses, a representative. It could be an Elijah or a David. But he's got to have a man. Okay? I've said it to the T. That my Isaiah 53 has been out there for over two years. And I get nothing. Don't tell me these people like Toby and Jews for Judaism haven't heard some rumblings. I can't say exactly what. God doesn't tell me things like that. He'll never tell me what another person's thinking. He won't tell me anything to happen in the future. If I can't find out an answer of my own, then I don't find it. They don't give it to me. You know. But, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> well, my first lesson, and, and this is for the rabbis who think, God, this can't be, or he's not David. Uh, we're not working with him to dismiss. They just won't pretend it's not there. Yeah, you're not going to heaven. Okay? That's every rabbi on the face of the earth. I would include religious leaders. Matter of fact, if I had my way and I don't, I'd include the government because they're leaders. But let's get to this first. Because y'all don't know God like I know God. I've been looking for 13 years in the fire of the fire. Punishment. Chastisement, maltreatment, crushing, bruising, wounded. And it is constant and incessant. I will say this, I couldn't see it for about five years. But it has changed me. I am, I am such a different man today than I was. When this thing started, I was no more capable of handling the tasks that are before me since it's clearing the way for the building of the third temple. Just talking in front of people. I was a lawyer, but I was a book lawyer. I didn't like talking to some people. Matter of fact, I can't remember the time I ever had. I wasn't sociable. I just, uh, I was a loner. All that's different now with God in me. The Spirit of God, you know, I'm in my spirit, and my spirit's in me. Guess what? God's in His Spirit, and His Spirit's in Him. It's the same thing. And his spirit is the angel of his presence. He made an angel, created an entity, a person, in existence, with emotions. And for his body, he did not give him human form and wings. No, 
His body is the Spirit of God. So if God comes to you, or the angel of the Lord comes to you, you are, for that time, a man of divine name. Now, the man uh, who wrestled with Jacob, that's just, God just saw Saul near Jacob, woke him up, told him, I'm the God of this land, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have something for you to do. And it's all to do with God. It's instant. You know who he is. There's no, huh? Who is it? You see, there's none of that. You see, you say, okay, let's go. I'm ready. What are we doing? <laughs> He's a man of divine beings, but he was just one number. So he didn't go through much of a fire refinement, if any. I mean, he had to wrestle all night. But God does this with all of his prophets. It's just a way of changing this. It's like, you know, he has to break our will. And he can't have me snapping at people. I was known as a fighter. And, you know, if you said something to me that I didn't like, I didn't respond verbally to you. I just, I just hit you. I just laid in to you. If I tell them, nobody talks to me like that. That's how I was. And that's, God said, this was taking so long. <laughs> you know, it's got, the last three years have been the worst out of 13. Going on 14 now. It's, you know, as he says, it just takes more to get the response out of you, the, the small change that I want out of you. I, and I'm saying, I'm ready. I am flat out ready. And what is the problem with your people? They don't know who you are. When you say other destruction is coming, you're not fooling around. Here's, here's what, you know, you kind of get uh, one personality of God in the Hebrew Bible. You know, it's not far ranging. But what he showed me is based on the following. This is one of the first lessons he gave me. And anybody can, can look at this. I don't have my glasses on. I'll get through it the best I can. But this is the chapter that leads to the purpose of the Temple Mount. And it's uh, 2 Samuel, chapter 24, verse 1. The anger of the Lord arose. Okay, I gotta get my glasses. Bear with me. The anger of the Lord again flared up against Israel. And he incited David against him, saying, Go and number Israel and Judah. That be the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, sometimes the kingdom of Ephraim, the largest uh, tribe landowner, immediately north of the lands of Benjamin, which is a partition between uh, Ephraim and Judah. And Benjamin is considered part of Judah because that's where the kings rule from. Go on down with them. Apparently there's some, problem, there's some problem in taking the census. I don't know what it is. But uh, he incited David to do it. And then he put him into a three-pronged test. Do you want me to come against the people? Do you want me to come against you? And one other one. And he said, let it be against the people. Let no man take me. And God did and he kills uh, pestilence. And 70,000 had died almost immediately. Now, did God just go down and kill 70,000 uh, Israelites? No. He takes the credit for it. It just makes him look mainly tough, listen to everything I say. The pestilence was already there. God could see it. He knew it was coming. And he does this a lot. He says, I will come with utter destruction. No, his creation is going to utterly destroy Israel. I would suggest, he won't tell me, I would suggest we'll talk to nuclear bombs from Iran right now. Someday. And they'll do it. They will do it if they get it. In any event, that's how... Oh, and it's interesting, the numbers are different. The census numbers are a little bit different from what I'm about to read in um, 1 Chronicles. 
and so is the amount of money paid for the people out out of David's pocket, is what he makes it sound like, but I'm sure it was the kingdom's money. I would think so. I, I don't know why he'd have a separate side job or anything. If you turn to 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, it's the same story. He even says it's the same story somewhere in here. Maybe there's a footnote. Uh, Satan arose against Israel and incited David to number Israel. And then you get the same story. You know, David, David realizes what he did was wrong. See, he incited him. He didn't even go tell him. He went to a prophet who told somebody and this and that. And then David was all uh, wanted to be in repentance and was sorry he had done it. And again, I don't know why it's bad. Um, today, they won't tell me. I've asked them right before we started this. <laughs> They'll know. So, um, what, 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 what is, what do we have here? Satan inside of David and God inside of David in the book of the prophets and in the writings, in the writings it's Satan. First of all, Satan doesn't exist. Judaism doesn't believe in hell, and they shouldn't. There is no hell. God's got, you know, if you don't heal or rear him, if you sin all the time, he just doesn't pay attention to you. He knows his creation. He knows what humanity does. He knows what humans are. He knows there's no stopping that. And, uh, I don't know, you might, you might say, Billy got a special place for Hitler? <laughs> and answer is, he's telling him no. I just don't, I don't think about it. He doesn't mean anything to me. But why is that in here? You, you would want to say, well, if I had to go either way, I say, uh, uh, one, one Samuel is who you go with because that's the book of the prophets. And I, I'd agree with that, except God wrote this whole book. He had a whole thing of it. It's not just Torah. You don't forget that. It's not just the Torah dictated to Moses. If you, uh, the book of Ezekiel, just as soon as Ezekiel wrote it, might not be the case, might not be all of it, but, you know, just go with that. Whoever the main character is, they wrote it for God, because if they're talk if he's talking to you, and he's going to be with you quite a while, like in writing one of these big books of 70 chapters, you're going through the fire of assignment. Moses went through the fire of assignment. You know how you know? Because it breaks your will. It makes you humble. It, 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 it takes anger out of you that you used to not be able to control. We start with Moses. He killed the man. He was so angry. He was getting into fights. Then he runs away. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't account for himself. He doesn't ask for, for, for uh he, he doesn't repent. He runs away. He doesn't take account for his own actions. Not a good person. At the end of his life, it is said in the Bible, Moses was the most humble man on earth. <laughs> God said, Keith, I put that in there primarily for you. So you would understand, you're not the only one that's ever gone through this. He says, you're tops. I mean, you're four prophets in one. Uh, Moses would be number two as far as the severity. But it took a man with that kind of anger, and Ezekiel had that kind of anger. He said, he said, I wanted a, a spirit seized me, and I went in bitterness and the fury of my spirit in the hand of God. He's in the hand of God, but he's bitter and furious. I know the feeling. That's the fire of refinement. That is the key to understanding Isaiah 53 and those words. A man is wounded, chastised, brushed, crude, uh, bruised, now treated. So that I can go to those who are suffering guilt for sin and have the ability to make them understand God is here. Go to Judaism. Be observant. Stop sinning. Your guilt will go away. I offer myself to go through the fire of refinement so that I can remove your guilt. That's what it's all about. That's the first six verses. The witnesses. Running for our sins. Bruised for this. Crushed for this. 
Okay? It's, and, and it's just for me to be prepared. Now, he didn't even ask Ezekiel. He didn't have to ask me. You don't say no to him. He's God. You don't say no. You say, okay. I said, okay, a million times, I believe. But, so to, to explain this, God says, just imagine a scale with the most, the, the finest, goodest, <laughs> nicest, kind, merciful person you could ever meet. And down here, put Satan, the meanest, most vile, uh, brutal, doesn't care about your pain. And he can go all through it. Okay? He, he, he literally decides what emotions he's going to have. Now, I'm in the fire of Simon, and I call this the black hat, this the white hat. This is what he called me. And we have a lot of good times in here. I mean, there's a lot of white hat, and the Holy Spirit's always in the white hat. Uh, he can be a troubler sometimes, but, you know, it's kind of set up by God, where <laughs> he's sent to the sight thing. Uh, and, and then, um, the black head. This is where he is with me most of the time. The fire of the But we get over here. We get over here. Uh, the point is, he's not just, uh, listen to what I say, or I'll put a pestilence on you. Uh, you don't stop sinning. I'm, I'm going to exile you. Uh, I'm going to take your temple. He, that would be someone over here. Not necessarily to Satan. But he said, that's why that was written that way. So I can tell you that. But he, he's really, I mean, when he's flat out in the middle, he, he, I just love that personality. It just does me well. So, um, he, he wants me to tell the Jewish people about him. And my, you know, my story, there's a lot I can't get into. I mean, he told me two things right off the bat. One, I don't care about Shekinah. And there's nothing I won't do to get you ready. There's no role I won't sing to. I will lie to you. And he, yeah, I know since God doesn't lie. In the fire of time, he does anything to incite me. That would come under chastisement. Uh, wounding, slamming me to the ground. He's broken my chin open two or three times, cracked my skull. I got a nervous bed, uh, black eyes, skin off my face. Uh, that's wounding. And you, you know, you ask me, what is this really doing to change me? But it eventually does. I still don't understand it. I told him I never understand it. <coughs> but indeed, it's working. So, uh, for the rabbis, if you think by ignoring me with the amount of evidence God has put before you, I mean, he planned this entire book before he made creation and selected his chosen. The entire thing. That's why you only see the angel of his presence and Holy Spirit one time. Judaism says Holy Spirit is not a person. <laughs> There's plenty of evidence in the scripture that he is, and I can tell you personally he is. And he's a great little person, too. But let me carry on. It's somebody, he's not, I guarantee you. If Toby is senior in Jewish and Judaism, he's sitting back there going, well, you know, we make money. Oh, that's what right. they wouldn't say we make money on all that. Or we can't say we're wrong because of your arrogance. And the, the ignorance that you show in your commentary just defies logic to me because God told me from the get-go. You know, I was an atheist for 50 years, had nothing to do with religious people. He said they were very intelligent um, uh, people. Uh, Judaism is, is, is well-based, on the ground, all makes sense. That's what he told me in the beginning. <laughs> Since then, I learned a lot different. I don't think much about their capabilities at all. Remember, I'm a prophet. God taught me. God controls my mind, my thoughts, my words, my physical motions, because I'm in the cords of his power. He can screw me like a top if he wants, slam me to the ground. He can make me, he can make me shake like a leaf. 
so that when I try to eat, I can't hold my food on the utensil, and I end up having to use, take the bowl and put it, you know, just embarrass you. Uh, now, I think you're really humiliating me. It is now treatment, but I can tell you I sure don't like you doing it. And he's got to want to do it with my legs. What do you feel you're going to fall down? Sometimes I dread walking down the steps when he's got me right in the midst of, um, he, he calls it a three day thing where you, you know, where he says at least once a week, if not twice. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And eventually that kind of treatment, maltreatment, changes you. And it also makes me, you know, I know what I've been through. I know the pain that I've been through. And I'm not even counting the accidents he put me through, being shot, giving me cancer, and shot through the abdomen. I'm, not, I'm just talking about since he came and started talking to me when I was 50. Um, well, let me go over this reckoning again, because apparently it's just not getting through. And if those particular rabbis aren't listening, I get plenty of views. I mean, I guess 4,000 or something, which is nothing for the big boys. But, you know, I'm not a, a rabbi. Uh, certainly not a, anything to do with Christianity, Pastor. You know, I stayed away from religious people. I can't ever remember having a religious conversation uh, until uh, I was 50 with God. When he said, let's go buy you a Tanakh. And I said, what's a Tanakh? And uh, that's when he started teaching Folks said, apparently this, I don't know, I don't know their answer to this, I'd love to hear it. Why don't you know about this? Thus said the Lord God, I am going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them for my flock, and I will dismiss them from tending the flock. Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them to tend them. He shall be a shepherd to them. I, the Lord, will be their God, my servant, that it shall be a ruler among them. Not a king ruling over them, among them. In the mission of Torah, Brandman's got two chapters on King David, and he's making every bit of it up. He's thinking, what would the Davidic dynasty be like today? And off he goes. None of it's in the Bible. None of it. King Oshiach will study Torah all the day and all the night. No, he doesn't. Not even close. That's what we, they, they got the Torah down. We, I mean, you know, I know enough about it. It's not like I haven't read it, but it's not like the prophets. Ain't it so much to the writings. My servant David, he shall tend them. He shall be a shepherd to them. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be the ruler among them. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will grant them a covenant of friendship. Again, it is so far removed from the Messianic era. Uh, why, don't, why, why don't the rabbis recognize that? You won't be the taunts of nations. You won't be defeated and dispersed again. His sanctuary amongst you, the world will know he sanctifies Israel, a planting of a man. That's it. That's what happens when Moshiach comes. You tell him I said so. You, if, you, if it looks like I'm a little, I get a little hot about this, God controls my emotions too. And that's how he wants them to hear it. And never forget, he can speak straight through me. As a rule, he's always speaking through me since he controls my thoughts and my words. But it's always based on my personality. He can change that. He can change that. But if you're not a believer in a, a man of our being, it doesn't help. You just think I'm putting on an act. Um, I mean, I've had conversations with him where I'm looking into a mirror, okay? And when you're talking to people, you...
you, you know, uh, you know, you know what your demeanor is. You know, you know what you're sounding like and what you look like. And I'm looking at a mirror, and again, according to his power on me, I really had a conversation with him. And I look in the mirror, and that's not who I am in that moment, and it's not what I sound like. And, he, you know, he, this is my lessons. I had lessons all day long, and I had for 13 years. I mean, he's doing something with me all the time. And, and primarily, again, this control in my mind is based on my capacity as Elijah to teach you how you can think in heaven. Your spirit reads your mind. Okay, your mind takes in, you know, your mind gets electrical impulses, little chemicals, different tissue, and it just, it takes in what eyes can take in and what ears can take in. Your person is the spirit in you, spirit and soul. And um, together, spirit and soul form a person. The, the soul's kind of like the DNA of who you're going to be. In heaven, you don't have that mind. 